Hello everyone, today I wanted to share a project that I've been working on in the past few months. Actually more than that, started working on this back in February. It's the new ADXL345 MCU2, now called Kuspa, Clipper USB Accelerometer. So uh, if that name isn't too obvious, it lets you connect uh, ADXL345 with a USB cable instead of relying on flying wire SPI. If all this sounds familiar to you and if you've uh, been a subscriber on the channel since uh, 2021 or 2020 something like that uh, this might sound familiar and that's because i did the original adxl 345 mcu back in the day so it was this thing it, uh, it the goal with this was the same but it's just had some limitations the size the price the you know, uh, more difficult to use because you needed an external boot uh, external flasher to flash the bootloader etc so it had some limitations, I'll talk more about those later in the video, but this design solves all of those and yeah, it is very easy to use. The reason why you might want to use a USB cable to connect your ADXL345 instead of relying on the flying wire SPI is A, it is easier, connecting a USB-C cable is significantly easier than you know dealing with those individual pins, but more importantly, in my opinion, it's much more reliable, which is the reason I designed this back in the day, I just couldn't get these and other types of ADXL345 modules working reliably with just flying wire SPI. If you didn't know, SPI isn't actually designed to run on wires, it's a very sensitive bus to electrical noise and, and if you have problems doing clippers input shaping tuning like getting invalid ID responses and things like, things like that, uh, it's likely because of the SPI wire and yeah, this is the that's the reason why you might want something like this. This is very easy and very reliable. So, so let's mount this to a 3D printer on my Micron and let's do a demonstration of this. And after that, I'll talk about uh, where you can find the files for this, which is GitHub. But yeah, it's linked in the description below in case you want to skip all that. So let's do a demo of the Kuspa on the Micron. You can also do this, yeah, use this on a self burner or you know any other boron toolhead and probably with a lot of other toolheads as well, as long as you have a mount. So in this case, as I said, I'm demonstrating this on the Micron and it has a mini afterburner. So I use the mini afterburner mount. There is also a self burner mount and others should be relatively easy to design as well. So all you have to do is after flashing clipper to the uh, RP2040, all you have to do is mount the Kuspa to your toolhead connect the USB-C cable and uncomment a single line in your printer.cfg which is an include command that has well includes the file with the rest of the arguments which is also available on the github repository along with everything else I'll get to that after you just uncomment that single line you're ready to do your ADX R345 tuning now there is one quirk with this design and that is you have to run accelerometer query once and you will get an invalid ID response, which is expected. It's just something with this design, but every single accelerometer query you will you run after that will uh, return values, uh, normal values, and it will work just fine after that. We can also run a measure access noise to see how much noise it generates on the axis. Uh, for example, in this case, I'm running this on the laptop. It's uh, so uh, if you're seeing a screen recording that's on the desktop, the numbers won't be exactly the same, but it should be in the same ballpark. I got 27 on the X, 24 on the Y, and 25 on the Z. I've seen the access noise numbers as low as 999, all three were nine different decimals, obviously. So the ex access noise on the the measurements on the Kuspa are very good. Uh, yeah, I'll just stop rambling and let's run a shape or calibrate. So I'll zoom in on the toolhead so you can actually see it moving and I'll run a shape or calibrate. And as you can see, the toolhead started moving. It will do the X axis and the Y axis after that and we'll get the results. The x-axis test completed and now it's running on the y-axis. The y-axis test completed as well. Now it's just running the calculations. As you can see, the test completed successfully and it is very easy to do your input shaper tuning using this. Now that the test is done, all you have to do is do a safe config on your terminal and then uh, disconnect uh, Kuspa and remove the mount and then uncomment that, uh, sorry, comment a single line in your printer.cfg, the include command and 
uh, yeah, very easily just to your input shaper tuning, as I said. So I think this is a really nice tool to have your in your 3D printing toolbox. All of the files of this are now available on GitHub, including the Gerber files, the uh, BOM files, the pick and place so files, the source file for the PCBs in case you want to modify them, the mounts, the documentation, the uh, the, the in what you add to your printer.cfg using include so that separate cfg file everything is available on the github repository using the gerber bomb and pick and place files you can easily order a puspa from your favorite pcb manufacturer jlc pcb pcb way just a couple uh, companies that come to mind a few vendors were also closely following the development of this project when i shared updates of this project on the war on design server so i wouldn't be surprised if someone decides to sell these uh, assembled pcbs on their store as well and if they decide to do that they will also be linked in the github repository which is linked in the description below so i originally ended the video there but i just wanted to talk about the evolution of the uh, kuspa project starting from the version 1.0 uh, back in the day called adxl 345 mcu through version 2.0 2.1 and 2.3 and no my name is in microsoft or Voron design i didn't skip 2.2 i'll talk about what happened to that as well but yeah first of all i want to talk about the original adxl 345 mcu as i said this aimed to do the same thing but it had some limitations and i'll mostly talk about those in that in this video but i made videos about this in the past as well if you're interested about details about this project as well but yeah the limitations of this was a you needed this adxl 345 GY291 if I remember correctly module as a daughter board because you couldn't get the ADXL345 assembled on a PCB at least not through JLC PCB at the time but now that's a possibility another thing was the MCU choice it used an STM32 F103 which now has three problems it had two problems back in the day a it's more expensive B, it's currently on Optanium so that's the new one uh, thanks to the component shortage and C uh, you have to flash a bootloader or I think technically you can flash Clipper directly to it as well But you have to flash it through an external programmer, which is why these pins were on the PCB So you needed an extra tool to uh, flash it which was an extra step So so this was big expensive on Optanium and uh, wasn't as easy to use because you needed an external programmer So uh, I wanted to improve this design which is why I started working on the version 2.0 back in February and received the first prototypes in March it was still called ADXL 345 MCU, so now it was ADXL 345 MCU 2 Electric Boogaloo, obviously. It used a Raspberry Pi RP2040 as its MCU instead of the unobtainium and expensive and not and it's an external flasher stm 32 f 103 so this uh, solved already solved three of those problems. This was an option back in the day, so that's why I didn't use this back in the day. Uh, and it also moved ADXL 345 on the PCB, so yeah, it fixed four of the limitations of the original design. But uh, unfortunately, this first prototype, I ordered five of these, uh, didn't work as reliably as I hoped. Basically, except the first query, the individual queries to the ADXL 345 on here worked just fine. But uh, once you started doing the actual tuning, meaning you were uh, constantly querying the ADXL 345 for measurements, it just eventually just failed. And not only it failed, it also erased the flash. I had a few theories about the, why this was happening at the time, which is what I tried to improve with the version 2.1, but uh, none of those theories were correct. I'm, I'm not an engineer, I'm just learning this stuff as I go, so yeah, that's not too surprising, I guess, but I still hope the version 2.1 works reliably. Version 2.3, by the way, fixes that issue, which I'll get to that. But uh, yeah, I ordered version 2.1 uh, to, again, try to fix those problems. As you can see, the PCB is, was also significantly smaller, and it added a bunch of quality life, of life improvements, like these test pad, like these test pads on the back and on the front here as well. The original one only had these three, which were on an unpopulated pin header slot. So, yeah, it had more pin headers for quality of life. It was also smaller, but still used M two and a half mounting claws, which is something I improved with the current design as well. Four out of five of these worked uh, perfectly, but one out of five of these had a problem, which is uh, was I didn't catch that initially, which is I, why I technically released these files at first and then quickly removed them from GitHub after that. But uh, yeah, tech, I announced it, so one person ended up ordering these, but apparently his works just fine, so yeah, it didn't cause anyone uh, any money, I guess. But yeah, the problem was with one out of five of these, four out of five of those actually worked perfectly, as I said was uh, once you disconnected the USB-C cable, so when the board lost power, the flash got erased. So actually the same symptom, just like uh, 
the original one, so original one didn't uh, finish doing the ADXL345 tuning, it just failed, but the end result was the erased flash. So actually it was the same symptom, so this design actually didn't fix it, it just, I guess, made the SPI bus run between the ADXL345 and the RP2040 more reliable or something like that, but yeah, that didn't fix the problem, so I started working on this and trying to figure out what was going on, and yeah, basically just removed a bunch of components and did some measurements. So a lot of components got sacrificed to the PCB guts. As you can see, there were other PCBs that were ruined as well. And I eventually figured out the, that these capacitors weren't a perfect match for the crystal. And after doing some research, a lot of research actually, so teaching myself how to match these perfectly, I also realized that this resistor also wasn't a perfect match. So yeah, it all came down to the crystal supporting components. So it technically was an easy fix but it took a lot of time because I as I said I'm learning as I go which is what I fixed with the 2.3 but as I said there actually was a 2.2 so 2.2 was a minor quality of life improvement over the version 2.1 back when I thought version 2.1 was uh, fine it just made these uh, mountain calls m3 size instead of m2 and a half sized technically version 2.1 was supposed to have m3 sized holes but I just ordered the wrong Gerber but yeah, 2.2 made those holes larger and it also made these test pads larger so it was a minor quality of life improvements which were uh, carried to the version 2.3 as well so the larger test pads in the back and at the front and uh, the m3 mounting holes so yeah those plus the uh, now uh, correctly matched the capacitors and the resistor for the crystal so though it came down to that so it was a uh, easy fix it just took me a while to figure that out Eventually I got there and I'm very happy with the result, which is why I'm confident releasing this to the public. I tested these very extensively. I basically spent an entire day testing these, just eliminating some of the possibilities. So this is the initial testing, the notes from that, just a few hours of testing. But after all five of these past those tests, I also just started doing random shit, trying to see if I can just, uh, you know, make these fails. They all survived and they all worked fine after that. So. Yeah, I think these should be very reliable, which is, as I said, why I'm confident releasing these to the public. So, yeah, uh, as I said, a few months, few hundred dollars, but I'm very happy with the result. Uh, I don't usually promote this stuff, but since this was a big project that took many months and a few hundred dollars to develop, I thought I should still mention this. If you feel like supporting the development of this project and the channel in general, uh, you don't have to, but if you feel like it, I do have a Patreon and I also have the YouTube channel memberships enabled. Yeah, if that's something you are interested in, those are linked in the description below as well. But yeah, that's it for this video. I hope you found this project interesting. If you did, please leave a like down below and thanks for watching.